My interests include arthroscopy, which is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, mainly the shoulder, or only the shoulder, and uh, joint replacement, as well as uh, any type of fractures. So this is an overview. If any of you have ever had any shoulder problems, I'm sure some of this terminology will click in your head. We're going to go over the shoulder anatomy to start, because I'm going to say a bunch of words that are uh, a little long, and uh, hopefully that we can remember them. Uh, impingement, which seems to be very common, cuff tears, capsulitis, uh, shoulder dislocations, AC joint arthritis, calcific tendonitis, as well as uh, shoulder arthritis and biceps tendinopathy. So we'll go over everything. Shoulder anatomy. Now these are just the small muscles around the shoulder. Um, we have some larger muscles up in the shoulder girdle, uh, the deltoid, the pectoralis, the trapezius, and the latissimus. Um, here we have four muscles holding the ball and socket joint together. The shoulder is made up of three joints, the humerus, which is your upper arm, the scapula, which is your shoulder blade, and your clavicle, which is your collarbone. That's it. So it's really only held onto the body by soft tissue, as well as a small joint on the inner part of your body. Um, these muscles are attached to bone with tendons. Ligaments will hold bone to bone, whereas tendons hold muscle to bone. A lot of uh, nerves around the area, it's our brachial plexus. Our axillary nerve is right under, in our axilla actually, actually. and uh, sometimes it's, in it's uh, at risk for injury if you do these procedures in open fashion, the way we used to do them in the past. Uh, we do have major arteries passing through there and a lot of bursa, which I'll discuss later around our shoulder joint. This is the inside of the shoulder. So you can see where the humeral head was removed so if you can think of a golf ball on a tee, the golf ball is removed, and now you're looking at the golf ball. It's called the glenoid. It's that thing right in the middle, and it's very shallow. We also have a labrum around the glenoid, which deepens the socket in order to provide stability. Uh, the biceps tendon is uh, a tendon from your biceps muscle, which traverses two joints, both your elbow and into your shoulder, and it's one of the few intra-articular tendons that is at risk a lot of the time. Um, this one, this picture right here shows the way your, your arm works. Right now your arm is in an, what we call an abducted position or outward position and you can see the way the ball and socket work. So the bursa, the muscles, the joint, the ligaments around this area all have to work in a sort of fashion where if one of them screwed up then it messes up the rest of the structures around the shoulder. So when you guys come and see your doctor and you got a lot of shoulder pain with uh, many different maneuvers or activities, he may just tell you you got one thing. Um, most of the times that's pretty much what you got, but when we send you to therapy and rehab and uh, treat you non-operatively, um, you may present with other things, but they're all interconnected. So the first thing we're going to do is shoulder impingement. You can see the bursa right there, just under the, clav uh, the clavicle and the acromion's red, compared to this one, which is blue. The red means it's inflamed. And impingement essentially means that you don't have enough room under your acromion, which is uh, part of your shoulder girdle, part of your scapula, and it connects to your clavicle. I don't have a pointer here. Otherwise, you can see here on this x-ray, the uh, small little spurs coming down. And what happens here is that the bursal sac, which prevents soft tissue from rubbing on bone, can get inflamed. And that can occur from any type of injury to your muscle. Um, this picture down here, I have different, I have a picture of the uh, chromion, which is in three different variations. The one to your left is a normal appearing one. The one in the middle is somewhat curved. And the one on the right is sort of hooked. The one on the right, which has a high hook on it, it's a type 3 acromion, um, they normally always necessitate surgery, and this is where x-rays come into play. Um, when you guys come in to see the doctor, they'll initially start off with x-rays, treat you, see what happens, have you come back, and if you still have uh, your symptoms persisting, then they'll go ahead and obtain an MRI to show soft tissue. Uh, in this case, patients who present with impingement, when they come into my office, they don't really have a previous traumatic event. They can, but if it's just isolated impingement, there's really no traumatic event. You have pain on that side when you're reaching overhead, when you're reaching away from you, uh, when you sleep, but you pretty much have full strength 
and you have full motion, both actively and passively. What do I mean by actively? You being able to move your arm, moving it up, as opposed to me being able to raise your arm. And that's a physical exam uh, that we take to see what you guys actually have. So here's a picture of the AC joint and the acromion, and you can see that uh, this has been surgically taken care of, at least the one above. You can see part of the AC joint has been removed. Why do we remove it? Well, joints that are arthritic, we either replace them, fuse them, or remove them. Some of you have had knee replacements. Some of you would have hip replacements. Well, these are the joints that we need. We just replace those. Uh, in your ankle, in your hand, and a couple of other joints uh, that are arthritic, we don't necessarily replace them because our joint replacements aren't the best in those particular joints, so we end up fusing them. In this case, the AC joint, which is your acromioclavicular joint, doesn't necessarily need a lot of motion. So we only end up removing a little less than a centimeter and let it scar in, and it provides enough relief. Um, so on the physical exam, when uh, the doctor asks you to do certain maneuvers causing you pain, he's just checking to see what you got. And the treatment for this, um, I was asked earlier by, by someone here in the audience, well, how do you know if you have numbness shooting down your arm if it's your shoulder? Well, it could be coming from your neck. And that's where a good thorough exam comes in as well as a history when we're asking you all these questions. Do you injure your neck at all? Do you have any numbness shooting down your arm? If you do have numbness, it's probably coming from your neck or a nerve that's entrapped. You shouldn't have numbness with any type of shoulder problem, uh, mainly just pain, although sometimes herniated discs do cause pain. But in this case, we may end up giving you an injection in the office, in the area in question, and if it alleviates your pain, then most likely it's your shoulder. If we end up injecting your shoulder and you still have the numbness and pain shooting down your arm, it's probably coming from somewhere else. Um, a lot of the times, patients will end up getting better with therapy, injections, activity modifications, as well as a short course of uh, nostril anti-inflammatories. And when they do return, they're either fully improved or almost improved to where we can just say, okay, just continue the home exercise program, come back if it gets worse. So now we go into rotator cuff tears. Now, with rotator cuff tears, you can present with impingement. And this is where the difference between a rotator cuff tear and impingement is. With impingement, remember I mentioned you guys have full active motion and full passive motion. With a cuff tear, depending on how long it's been, how much pain you have, um, you may end up having full passive motion if you're not stiff yet, but your active motion might be diminished. Number one, because it caused pain. Number two, because it's weak. So I'm always asked, well, I didn't injure myself. How did it happen? Well, this tendon doesn't have the best blood supply. So we really don't want to tear it if we, if we can avoid it, but we can't. Um, a lot of it is from repetitive microtrauma or even any type of injuries, uh, which can affect any, any part in the shoulder. Um, patients come in, they're unable to sleep on that side, and again, they're having trouble with overhead activity. They can only raise it so far. Um, I see a lot of patients come in with cuff tears that have been diagnosed decades ago or even years ago and they're not fixed. Um, our literature goes in circles. Fix it, don't fix it, fix it, don't fix it. So it all depends on when you actually saw your physician. Um, also if they operate or not. As an orthopedic surgeon, if I see something that's torn or broken, I want to fix it. Now right here you can see the picture that I have here shows that the humeral head not only sits on the glenoid, but it's, it's elevated up. And I'm going to show you a better picture like that. Um, this one shows that the tendon not only is torn, but the muscles retracted. This makes it far more difficult to fix. Um, so when I see patients initially, I'll test their passive motion and see if they have full motion. If they have full motion, then we're going to surgery. If their passive motion and active motion is, is, is decreased, then they're getting stiff. And uh, that's something else that I'm going to go over, uh, most likely some type of adhesive capsulitis where the tissues are getting tight, and we need to regain that motion before we go operate on you. Now right here is three different shoulders with rotator cuff tears. This is an MRI. And I'm asked quite a bit, 
once uh, patients come into my office, well, why don't you just get an MRI? Because I'm going to find abnormalities in all the MRIs that I look at. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's your pathology. Still, we ask questions, we perform our physical exam, and we'll always send you to at least a little bit of therapy to sort of eliminate other problems that can get better with non-operative treatment. That way we only focus on, on the problems that are causing your actual problem. Um, so the top left, you see an MRI with the humeral head sitting on the glenoid, golf ball on a tee, and you see the changes within the tendon at the attachment. So it's a full thickness tear, and most likely this happened recently because the muscle still looks good. It hasn't been uh, deteriorating. There's not a lot of fatty infiltrate, which tells me it's been there for a long time, and that can easily be fixed. Um, does it need to be fixed right away? Well, well there, there are certain studies that uh, have shown that if you do fix them sooner rather than later, most likely within the, within the first three months, your outcome is going to be better. The uh, image on the top right shows a tear, shows a little bit of retraction. You can see the muscle now is far away or farther away from the actual attachment. That needs to be fixed now. Otherwise, it, it ends up getting worse and worse, and your muscle takes forever uh, to regain its strength. And this is when patients can't believe me when I tell them it's going to take six months to a year for you to recuperate. The bottom left, that's just a bad M MRI. When I see those, I cringe. Could we fix them? Sure we can. Is it going to heal? Who knows? Again, it doesn't have the best blood supply. Um, even though we do repair it, doesn't necessarily mean that your arm's going to function appropriately. Uh, that's the plan, but sometimes the tissue is just so far gone that it'll re-tear. Um, when I see that bottom left x-ray, I take a look at the patient's age, their function, what their expectations are, and then we'll discuss whether they're going to have uh, arthroscopic surgery or even a joint replacement. So when patients come in and say, when should I fix this? I always tell them sooner rather than later. Because the longer we wait, the more chance you have of developing rotator cuff arthropathy, which is another topic that we're going to discuss. And uh, we'll see some pictures of that. So the bottom diagram is just so you can see where the cuff tear is. <clears throat> these, are these are pretty fun to fix. And uh, the reason why I have this picture, you see the normal one on your left hand side and the tor one, torn one on your right hand side. This just shows an isolated cuff tear. This is rare. Cuff tears aren't necessarily isolated. Again, it's degenerative wear and tear. So most likely you have a spur, most likely you have AC joint disease, most likely your biceps tendon is pathologic, and we have to do a number of procedures in your shoulder. And that does take a toll on you. Even though it's minimally invasive and we do it w through small little poke holes, it is rather painful. So I have this picture just to show you that the cuff tear is adjacent to the biceps tendon which is this structure coming up under the sheath. And a lot of the times that's pathologic and could be a source of pain. So this is a diagram showing uh, how we repair it. You see the picture to the very left uh, where you have um, a couple of instruments looking in the shoulder. And in this case, the cuff tear is cleaned up. The humeral head is prepared where you remove a little bit of that fiber scar tissue, provide a good bleeding bony bed in order to reattach it. And these are the anchors that we utilize. Um, anchors have been recreated, remanufactured with different type of material. Uh, we used to use plastic. We used to use bioabsorbable metallic ones. And now there's just a number of stuff we can use. Everyone's going to be different in what they use. Uh, and it's, as, as well as their comfort level. So when you place the anchors in there, you reattach the tendon. So you, see, you only have four little sutures holding this thing together. That's why we're very careful post-operatively. We have you in a sling and you're in supervised therapy for about a good four to six weeks. Sometimes we won't let you move for two to four weeks depending on how fragile the tissue is and how big of a tear you had. Sometimes you need to augment them with the graft. What do I mean by that? Well, it's either synthetic material or some type of cadaveric tendon that we end up uh, utilizing. Um, and I have SAD, Mumford and Biceps ten tendon, um, 
up there because when I repair them, I always do a subacromial decompression to give you more room. I also remove your AC joint if it's symptomatic because if I do end up removing it, it's because it had spurs and possibly even contributed to the tear. And the biceps tendon, once again, if you leave that alone and it's pathologic, you're going to continue to have pain. So adhesive capsulitis is the next thing we're going to talk about. You can see the capsule here with the glenohumeral joints, very red, irritated, contracted. And that normally is, for some reason, diabetics end up getting them. Uh, patients who have had injuries to their shoulder, who have not sought out treatment, um, or even post-operatively. That's why I'm pretty aggressive with therapy. Um, they're very hard to treat. Sometimes it could take six months to a year. We inject them to make sure that this is, uh, that hopefully decrease the inflammation. Um, but sometimes you do need surgical intervention where you come in and do a complete capsulectomy and sometimes your shoulder does get unstable. So I like to treat these for at least six months. Hopefully your pain does get better and your range of motion returns. Um, painful limited range of motion. Your range of motion is the same as what I can do and that means your capsules are tight. And you can see here with this MRI that there's no cuff tear, the tendons are all intact, but there's a decreased volume within the shoulder. So MRIs can help us with this diagnosis, but mainly it's the physical exam that gives us the best information as to diagnose uh, this problem. Um, sometimes we need to take you into the operating room and actually move your arm. That doesn't uh, feel good. <laughs> So injections and time in therapy. Um, shoulder instability. Some of you may have experienced a shoulder dislocation or know someone who has had a shoulder dislocation. Um, I have these three images up here. Um, on the left, I have an anterior dislocation, and on the right, I have posterior. When you do dislocate your shoulder, it's normally anterior. It comes out the front, and you may end up ripping your, uh, your rotator cuff or even your labrum. And there was a study out showing that the age is around 40 years of age. Anyone above 40 years of age, if they have a shoulder dislocation, most likely tear their cuff. If they're younger than this, most likely they tear their labrum. And I'm going to go over that as well during this procedure. Um, I've seen an inferior dislocation just recently. Otherwise, I haven't seen one since training. Those are very rare. Those can uh, present themselves with neurologic injury where you can't move your arm for a while. Hopefully your nerve isn't too damaged. Um, posterior dislocations, meaning your shoulder comes out the back, normally is either from seizures or electrocution. Those are rare. Um, you can see the nerves. You can see the nerves coming across the glenohumeral joint here. So those are always at risk. Um, you'll notice that if you do come in with a dislocation, your doctor will have you shrug your shoulders and see if you have sensation on the outside of your arm, which is where the axillary nerve uh, innervates. Um, if you do not get it fixed, most likely it will end up popping out again. And those of you who have experienced uh, shoulder dislocation, I'm sure you remember how it was very painful. Um, so top left. The same normal anatomy picture that I showed earlier with the labrum around the glenoid uh, to deepen up the socket. Top right, you can see that the capsule is disrupted on the front part of the glenoid and it's not attached, and that provides instability. Um, the bottom right picture is an actual arthroscopic picture where the sutures have been utilized to reattach the labrum. And on the bottom left, you can see the anchors into the uh, glenoid to reattach uh, the labrum and capsule. Sometimes we need to imbricate the capsule in order to provide stability. So now we go to the superior labrum, where the biceps tendon attaches. This one can occur with overhead activity. Uh, if you're involved in sports, such as volleyball, pitching, um, tennis, anything that requires overhead activity. I do get some... Uh, patients in their mid-30s, late-40s who are unable to throw a ball with their kids and it really gets them a little depressed. We end up uh, doing an exam, getting an MRI, and a lot of the times they have this pathology there. So we can fix this arthroscopically as well. And the good thing about doing it arthroscopically as opposed to doing it open is that you can find different pathology. Before we'd make an incision 
and that's all that we'd see. So we'd really have to rely on our history and physical exam. But now with the, with the shoulder scope, there's really nothing you can't fix that you can see with the shoulder scope that you can do without uh, making the small incisions and taking a camera in. Right here you can see the MRI on the top left where the bicep tendon has detached. Um, when patients do end up getting MRIs without the contrasts, it's hard to find. They're hard to see on the MRI. So you can have a, essentially a negative MRI and have the patient be symptomatic and treat him non-operatively until he fails and then you indicate him for surgery. And this is how we repair it. You can see that it's detached on the left, an anchor placed in the middle, two anchors placed on, uh, on the right side. And it's going to be up to your physician to see how many anchors they place and how many sutures they utilize. There's different ways of fixing it. Now we get to acromioclavicular osteoarthritis. This is your AC joint. Normally occurs with prior injuries um, to your shoulder girdle. That's an AC separation. So you might be talking to your friends and they'll say, oh, I had a shoulder separation. And then you start thinking, oh, wow. Well, to me, a shoulder separation is your glenohumeral joint. Whereas to some people, a shoulder separation is your AC joint. Um, causes pain, can't sleep on that side. And again, we'll inject that joint to see if that's the actual cause of your pain. And it can be associated with bicipital tendinopathy, rotator cuff tears, and also cause some impingement. Um, mainly it's just tenderness there at the area. Another problem is calcific tendinitis. Um, we don't really know what causes this. Um, lack of oxygen has been looked at, but we're still unsure. And when you have pain, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a cuff tear. You can still move everywhere. You got good strength. It's just very tender and painful. Um, this is diagnosed with a physical exam as well as uh, an x-ray. You can see calcific deposits in the area. Um, really, all you have to do is stick a needle in it and trephinate it. You decompress it, and that normally does the job. Um, if it doesn't work, then we end up taking you to surgery and debride your tendon. The problem with this is it thins it out. So you may end up having to have it repaired if the calcific deposit is too high. Um, then we do by shoulder, shoulder biceps tendonitis. Again, you don't, you're not only going to have just one problem here. Most likely they're going to be a bunch of them put together that can be addressed uh, with surgery and therapy. Um, repetitive, overhead, repetitive overhead use, degeneration, direct injury, and again, like I mentioned earlier, associated with cuff tears, impingement, and instability. This muscle is what controls flexion in your elbow as well as when you open up a doorknob. Um, we can go ahead and inject this area when you come into the office, um, right into the bicipital sheath. Uh, it fits into a groove and another muscle which controls motion turning inward uh, forms a roof um, of, the, uh, of the sheath here. And a lot of patients will complain of a snapping uh, area in the front part of their shoulder. Um, there's a number of ways that we can fix this. Uh, we can either do it arthroscopically or we can open them up. And the slap repair, which is what I showed you earlier, the labrum pathology, that's how we can fix it intraarticularly if we're in there with the scope, as long as the rest of the biceps tendon looks good. Um, in older people, most likely the biceps tendon isn't going to look good, and you have to end up doing a, an open tenodesis. Unfortunately, it's pretty hard to do arthroscopically. Um, you can see here the two different methods of fixing them with either suture and reattaching it to the area. You're not going to lose your strength that way, um, as well as uh, burring out a keyhole. There are a lot of orthopedic surgeons who, will, depending on what your body habitus is, they'll just snip the tendon. It does provide relief. Um, your strength is somewhat diminished, and you have a deformity. We call it a Popeye deformity because your muscle ends up dropping. So in thinner people, I don't like snipping it. I like at least to reattach it and hopefully uh, give them better cosmesis afterwards. And now we get to shoulder arthritis. You can see here the top picture on the left shows a shoulder joint with the muscle and the tendon that have been completely torn off and sort of what we call a high riding uh, glenohumeral joint. That means there's no stability in the joint. 
So you're going to get a lot of uh, clunking, a lot of degeneration. Um, your upper arm bone will go ahead and articulate with the top part of your shoulder girdle, which is not good. You shouldn't do that. That will cause a lot of pain. And I have these pictures up here because it shows both a shoulder arthroplasty, which is a normal shoulder replacement, and a reverse shoulder. And you can see the difference between them because in the reverse shoulder replacement, the ball and socket is reversed. And that's a fairly new procedure that's been out. It's had very good results. Um, but I think we're still trying to reserve this particular procedure for patients in their late 60s and so forth. Again, because we don't have long-term results of how it's going to last. But I can say that you do not need a rotator cuff for this to function. You can have this done as long as you have a nicely functioning deltoid and it'll provide you with pain relief as well as some function afterwards. Um, last couple of articles that I've read, they normally want you to be at least 70 years of age. Your motion has to be very limited and you shouldn't uh, be so active. So sedentary lifestyle would uh, definitely accommodate this, this um, implant. The uh, top part, which is a shoulder arthroplasty, that one you do need a, an intact cuff or a cuff tear that was recently torn that's repairable. Um, even though we sometimes still do normal shoulder replacement in patients who don't have cuffs or large cuff tears, it's just for pain relief. Again, it's predictable. We can tell you what your results are going to be. Um, so some patients will opt for, uh, for a normal shoulder arthroplasty. Um, it is a, an inpatient procedure where you're in-house overnight. Uh, it's a joint replacement, so you'll have to be careful with any dental procedures or any other surgical procedures afterwards. And uh, every, everything that I've mentioned here, uh, all the surgeries pretty much take around three to six months for you to finally be happy with your shoulder. And a lot of that is just maintaining your motion um, and waiting for your strength to get back. So I may have spoken a little fast, but I think we covered a lot of stuff, and I'm sure you guys have a bunch of questions. And uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you guys have regarding any problems with your shoulders or any previous surgeries that you've had. Yes, ma'am. you speak of in, uh, injection, are you talking about cortisone? Yes. Yes, for the knees, uh, we, we have developed uh, visco supplementation, which is a synthetic uh, joint fluid type injection, but that's only been studied in the knees. We are starting to do some studies in other joints. Not me, but some people are. Uh, but for right now, uh, just cortisone injections. You can inject it outside of the shoulder, in the area where the bursa is, or inside the shoulder, depending on what you're looking for. So like I mentioned earlier, you want to differentiate whether it's your neck, whether it's your shoulder, whether it's your AC joint, or your subacromial space, or even your biceps tendon. Um, you can inject certain areas. Sometimes you need more than one in different areas to really find out what's going on. But I think with the development of uh, MRIs, it's really saved you a lot of the time that you spent in rehab trying to fix something that's probably not fixable. So MRIs definitely do help. Um, but just so you guys know, it's not the first line of radiograph that we got. Yes, sir. I've been recommended to consider shoulder replacement. Mm -hmm. Does a steroid shot? the pain so you can put off the replacement or is, there, is it not wise to put off the replacement? Well it depends because steroid shots will affect healing later on. If I have patients with cuff tears, no cuff tear. okay I don't really inject them. If you have pain while you sleep on that arm or with any type of activity and your range of motion is limited and you do have a cuff then a shoulder replacement may end up helping you. Again what your expectations, well, you know, do you expect to go rock climbing? It's not going to help you. Do you want to go weightlifting? Not going to help you. How much strength do you lose? Things like brushing your teeth, combing your hair? No, you definitely do that. That shouldn't be a problem. What can't you do? Um, anything that re will require strenuous activity under your glenohumeral joint. So again, weightlifting, push-ups, pull-ups. Um, you can start lifting heavier objects as time goes on down to your waist level. It's going to be difficult to, um, yeah. 
Um, steroid injections will reduce inflammation that can be caused by degenerative changes in your joint. So if it helps, you can do it. But you got to remember, you're sticking a needle in your joint. There is a risk of infection. Although it's low, there is a risk. And if you do get infected, uh, I doubt you're going to find someone to do a joint replacement on that, on that particular joint. Uh, again, through physical exam. So let's say you come into my office and you say, I have pain shooting down my arm. Um, it feels better when I move my neck a certain way. It feels better when I put my arm over my head. Um, I have numbness shooting down my arm as well, into my fingers. Then we'll do an exam on you, meaning your neck, to check all the nerves, check all the function, check all the sensation and the reflexes, and also check your shoulder. If I can't get you to uh, have pain with certain, certain shoulder positions, then it's probably not your shoulder. At the same time, it could be your neck and your shoulder. So let's say I do an exam on you and I think you got a little bit of uh, bicipital tendonitis or even AC joint pain. I'll inject both of those areas. If your pain's gone, it's your shoulder. If it's not gone, probably your neck. If it's decreased, it could be both. So... Do you recommend the patients to a different type of doctor then if it's your neck? Uh, I do. I do. Well, as an orthopedist, we'd investigate it and then send you to get uh, the appropriate treatment. Because a lot of the times it'll be taken care of uh, with uh, conservative treatment and injections. So the comment is, she's been seeing a chiropractor for the past several weeks. It hurts with reaching across your body and reaching overhead still. And should you see an orthopedist? Well, chiropractors have their role in, in the medical community. Um, I didn't train chiropractic, so I, I'm not sure. But I have sent some patients to them, but mainly when it's just their spine. Um, if it's a joint, I'm sure there's a lot of chiropractors out there who know what they're doing and have a lot of experience. Um, if it's not getting better, How long should I, give I normally send patients to therapy at least four to six weeks before I want to see them back because it's like watching grass grow sometimes. You're not going to see a difference the next day or even a week down, down the road. It's going to take around four to six weeks. So different therapies, different treatment. Um, I have had patients who I've sent to therapy come back and call and say, I can't do this, it hurts too much. Then I know something's wrong and I have to investigate further with radiographic studies or perform another exam or another injection. Sure. George. If, if, uh, if you have a cuff tear, will, uh, will that repair itself? No. Um, the blood supply is tenuous. Most likely it's going to be retracted so it's not touching any bone. It's going to scar in and you'll still be able to have some function in your shoulder. You're not necessarily going to be uh, you know, weak in that area. It'll be weaker with some pain, um, but it's not going to heal itself. You need a little bit of help. It's going to strengthen the remainder of your muscles. The muscles that are around. Of, yes, around your glenohumeral joint in order to at least provide some stability. Now, at the same time, they're going to make sure you have full motion. And if you do have any other type of pathology, whether it's your biceps tendon, your AC joint, or your bursa, then therapy may alleviate those symptoms to a point where you're comfortable living the way you are and you don't want to undergo surgery or undergo the risk of surgery, then you're okay, we'll leave you alone. But if, if, if you need to use your arm, you're weak, not able to work, then you probably need to have surgery. What is the timeline for recovery with a 
total hip, uh, shoulder replacement? Approximately six months to a year. It also depends on how bad your muscle is. Did you get an MRI for your, for your shoulder? Okay, so there's proof that you don't have a cuff tear. Right. So that means you should be okay as far as your muscles are concerned. You're not gonna be perfect because with any type of arthritis, you're gonna have swelling, decreased pain, and inflammation, um, as well as possibly even intraarticular type problems where you have loose bodies floating around. So it depends on how long you've had uh, the arthritis, but I would say six months to a year. Um, you have the surgery, they put you in a sling, slowly start to move you. Uh, shoulder replacements can be done from either the top or the front. If they come in from the front, we remove your subscap, which is part of your rotator cuff, uh, and then open up your arm and put everything that we need to and then repair that muscle. That's our limiting factor. If we come in from the top, then we take down part of your deltoid and we have to let that heal. I don't like taking off part of the deltoid. I don't like coming in from the top because when you do have problems, if you do have problems after your shoulder replacement and you need a revision surgery or your cuff ends up tearing, then you're gonna need a reverse shoulder and I need that deltoid muscle to work. So I'd probably come in from the front. Now coming in from the front isn't without its risks. There's nerves, there's vessels in there uh, that you don't really wanna mess with. Yes? Well, just like you mentioned, there's some times where you can move it up, and I think your arm's in a different position where you use your bigger muscles around the area. And at the same time, when your bursa is swollen, it's going to irritate you and not allow you to move your arm freely. Also, even your AC joint, if it happens to bother you at that time. Your biceps tendon might play a role there as well. So it all depends on how you move it. So if you do end up let's say come in to see an orthopedic surgeon and we send you to therapy, they're gonna isolate your rotator cuff muscles and you'll know if they're weak or not, as, as will the therapist, and they may end up sending you back sooner rather than later, back, back to the surgeon to be reevaluated. Um, but it all depends on how your arm is when you're moving it up. I have patients come in saying the same thing you have by saying, well, I can raise my arm if I move it this way, and then as I'm moving up, move, turn it around, then I can put it over my head. But they can't do it straight like that. So that's because they're using different muscles. Um, even if you've had surgery in the past, the symptoms can recur. You can easily re-tear it. And I see a lot of these uh, tears when it starts to snow with the snow blower. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, with a lawnmower, and a lot of these patients will present with prior injuries that have been aggravated now by a jerking maneuver. Um, I'll have patients come in with their biceps tendon completely off, and they'll be like, oh yeah, that happened 10 years ago. I didn't do anything for it. Uh, but just to let you guys know, things change all the time as far as the treatment's concerned. Um, so some of us will want to fix it right away, some of us will say, ah, just go to therapy see what happens. It all depends on what your guys' expectation is. Are there vitamins or to prevent injury or wear on the joints and bones? Is there something that we can take? To Some people will argue yes. Some people will argue no. It's all about how you take care of yourself, prevent injuries, number one, from them occurring. Um, as far as the joint is concerned, I do have patients come into my office stating that they, their friend is taking glucosamine, chondroitin, and they feel better, so they want to take it. Sure, go ahead and take it. It's not going to harm you. But is there any specific vitamins out there to prevent uh, injuries? No. Not really. You just got to be careful with the way you do things. And uh, if you do injure yourself, give it a couple weeks, see if it goes away. Take some over-the-counter Advil. If it's too painful, then get checked, but uh, don't wait several months. You don't need to, not anymore. Um, a lot of surgeons out here nowadays are doing these procedures arthroscopically through five little poke holes, looking at a camera. You can ask for pictures, you can ask for videos, um, and uh, the success has been 
very high. I've been very happy with the uh, amount of minimal trauma that we place on the shoulder and faster recovery and less pain. Is there any correlation between the age of the surgeon and the technology that they would be using? Yes. Younger surgeons most likely have trained with arthroscopy, whereas older surgeons have, if they do it, they either have learned this new technique by going to courses and going to labs or having partners who now do them and doing the surgeries together. Um, there are some surgeons out there who've been practicing for 25, 30 years who've refused to see a scope. It's okay. The results were okay when we opened up the shoulders and there's no harm in doing it that way because if shoulders that have been operated on in an open fashion compared to arthroscopic shoulders pretty much have the same result after two years. Thing is, from now to two years is a long time. So doing it arthroscopically, you return to work sooner, less pain, less blood loss, and you get to do stuff sooner rather than later. Um, but ask, ask the surgeon if uh, it's gonna be done arthroscopically. When I first uh, came out, I used to tell patients, we're gonna attempt this arthroscopically, there's a slight chance I might have to open. I always tell them that. Um, I haven't opened up one that I didn't intend on opening yet. Um, it might happen. And if it does, it'll happen. But uh, I like the way the arthroscopy uh, results have been, at least in, in my practice. Any other questions? Well, I hope this was very informative. Come see one of the uh, orthopedists here at, uh, at this institution. Um, all of us have been trained with the latest techniques, and there's really, I don't think, any procedure that we can't do. Thanks for coming.